Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Evolving Test Strategy to Meet Growing Business Challenges. Our speakers today are two quality experts working at Pfizer Global Business Systems, Dave Harrison, Software Testing Practice Lead, and Chris Kane, Software Test Engineer. So without any further ado, uh, Dave, the stage is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Adi, and uh, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you on the uh, West Coast, good morning, and uh, I believe we might have some people that uh, need a good evening as well. So uh, thanks again for uh, taking some time out of your day to, uh, to participate and, uh, and view this presentation. All right, so just some uh, intros for uh, me and Chris. Uh, I am uh, celebrating uh, 30 years in software testing uh, during 2020. Um, the career in software testing has been very, very good to me. Uh, it was a really good choice for me to make at the time. Uh, just highlighting some of the variety of uh, industry backgrounds and business verticals that uh, I've been involved with. Um, I was uh, very proud of work that uh, I, I was a part of with healthcare information exchanges where uh, with patient consent, uh, you know, your, your health information and records can travel between doctors. You don't have to carry x-ray envelopes with you or anything. Um, also did some work in uh, supply chain software with uh, uh, radio frequency ID uh, middleware solutions. Uh, we set the stage, uh, simulated warehouse uh, conditions inside of a test lab. Uh, I learned how to operate an industrial printer that uh, was powered by compressed air instead of electricity. Uh, that was a really fun day. Uh, also did some work in uh, defense systems, uh, can provide no additional details there based on the, uh, the nature of what I was involved in, and uh, currently uh, working uh, on FinTech solutions. Um, I've done software testing vendor and user group meetings uh, and conference speaking uh, over the past years and across the Northeastern United States and uh, parts of uh, Atlanta, Canada. Um, I'd like to tell you um, about my participation in racket sports uh, as a hobby, but due to the situation with the pandemic, I can just tell you that I'm missing uh, the opportunity to participate in competitive racket sports. And uh, contact information for me is below, and uh, we will also have that uh, shown again at the uh, conclusion of the presentation. Uh, Chris, uh, I'd also like to introduce, he'll be uh, uh, joining uh, in a few minutes. Um, he, uh, he joined Fiserv uh, May of 2018. I'd like to tell people that uh, he walked across the uh, stage to get his uh, college degree on a Friday. Uh, spent Mother's Day weekend in the U.S. with his family and then uh, showed up for work that Monday. So it was uh, quite the transition for him. Uh, we promoted him into a microservices testing role in 2019. Uh, he's a, a proud graduate of Temple University, which is located uh, just north of uh, Center City, Philadelphia. Uh, he's continuing uh, to be engaged with uh, his alma mater. He uh, helps test a, uh, a software quality assurance course there uh, presently. And he's also um, working on content to um, put together coursework with a goal of having Temple offer a uh, software testing major inside of their School of Information Sciences and Technology. Uh, he uh, enjoys trying to solve technical uh, testing challenges. So here's our agenda. Uh, we just covered the intros, uh, some information about my background in test leadership. Uh, things get a little bit interesting in the, uh, in the plot after that. Uh, provide everybody some business context around uh, what it is that we work with, um, talk about an opportunity for providing technical leadership, um, see a demo of uh, part of our solution, and then uh, after that, uh, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. All right, so my background. Um, so, you know, here at Pfizer, I was actually hired um, into a company called Card Connect. Um, Card Connect had an IPO uh, along the way and then was acquired by First Data. First Data was then acquired by Fiserv. So uh, I think about um, my time where I've been uh, managing the testing team for four plus years across all these different business transitions, and it's been quite the roller coaster ride. Uh, when I started off leading the team, uh, the department was one person, uh, that was myself. Uh, it made it very easy to schedule department meetings. Um, it was could just, you know, anytime I was available, we could meet. 
Uh, but we scaled that up to 16 uh, full-time testers across three different testing groups. And uh, again, starting off, um, we had two application servers when, when uh, I started off in, in the leadership role, and it was a single test environment. Uh, what I don't put in writing is that part of that was shared with development. Uh, I don't like to admit it, but uh, we got along pretty well. Uh, but now uh, we're scaling to dozens of uh, virtualized application servers, and that's growing, uh, and that's across multiple test environments as well. Most of the uh, automated testing uh, that we've been doing has been with open source tools. Uh, we seek to, to uh, go after capital budgets as, as kind of a last option. Um, part of my role in leading the effort um, was to try to figure out what was next for automation and then make some recommendations and then start some projects off after that. But again, open source were the solutions by default. I'd like to talk about a, a vision and leadership. Um, I, I strongly believe that leaders of testing teams are, are not just people leaders. Uh, they're not just people that approve vacations and you know, are the person you tell that you, know, you have to leave early for whatever reason. Um, I believe that leadership goes beyond that. I believe um, um, leaders in testing organizations should be actively engaged in process leadership as well as cultural leadership. And I believe that uh, effective testing leaders that engage in those three um, can help drive a result of a pretty happy place to come to work, where uh, I like to say to the testers that, um, you know, we, we're doing hard things, but we're having fun doing them, okay? And I believe that's a big driver uh, of our culture. I don't want to downplay uh, technology, though. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite important. Um, I attended a uh, conference in Manchester, England, uh, test bash. Uh, I think many of you may be familiar with them. And um, the nature of the conference drives a lot of social interaction outside of the conference calendar. Um, all the restaurants and all the different hotels where people are staying are centrally located to where the conference is being held. So you, you find yourself in you know late night dinners with you know testers taking over the better parts of restaurants. And um, you know the conversation drove one night around visual validation. And uh, you know I, I'd had some some bad experiences in the past trying to pursue, you know, bitmap comparisons. You know, some of you may remember those types of tools that were out there. Um, but, you know, I heard at that conference about a vendor that was newer to the market, you know, who, is, who had done visual validation right. And, uh, and that vendor was, uh, was Apple Tools. So I come back from the conference and uh, a short time after, um, there's, you know, a plot twist, okay? Uh, I was uh, briefed on a reorganization in, in the technology organization that we were going to implement, you know, a quasi Spotify model. Uh, we weren't going to adopt the thing uh, completely. We were just going to take what we think would work well and apply it to, to our org. Um, but the, the key aspect of it for me was that cross-functional teams would now get the testers inside of their organization. So I would no longer be um, you know, managing any testers. Um, never really experienced any of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. I just really wasn't worried. Um, I uh, took it upon myself to uh, write a proposed job description for a practice lead. Uh, that took about 10 minutes to write. Uh, the core of it was to um, you know, make testing better and make testers better. Um, I say that a lot inside the organization. Okay, the, the Spotify model allows for disciplined leads and coaches. So you know, that was gonna be my proposed new role. Um, I would still have technical project involvement and I would be representing testing in general, if not as a manager. Um, but I would still have interaction and opportunities to work with individual testers to coach them and bring out the best in, in their skills and their interests and in careers in testing. Um, but the vision was still needed in that new role, um, you know, I, but I was I was kind of challenged to think about how I could communicate that vision, uh, even with a changed role in the organization. So I want to take a moment to uh, to provide some business context background to to what we do in our uh, business unit of Fiserv, and talk uh, about a business opportunity where uh, we could provide um, a better testing solution. 
So as far as our business context goes, you know, we provide what are called merchant services to businesses. A, a more, a more uh, common explanation for that would be, you know, if you go into a store and you swipe a card or dip a card or tap a device or scan something against the payment terminal, uh, what happens next, we take care of most of the remainder of the business cycle processing. Uh, one of the terminals uh, to, the, to the side of the slide is one that, that we sell and CardPoint is our, is our branded solution in this, in this market. Uh, we have external facing systems and internal facing systems. Um, you know, for customers, we provide some additional business intelligence, histories of transactions and customer trends. But one of the internal systems that we develop, uh, we're quite proud of. Um, you, know, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't see it really publicized on our site as a commercial offering. It's, it's something we use uh, internally. And it's a customer relationship management solution that's optimized for the payments business. Uh, we're in the middle of transitioning it to a microservices architecture. And it's, it's really the cornerstone of our application strategy. It's, it's widely perceived as a best in class uh, solution. As, as part of the, the customer life cycle for engaging in a merchant services business relationship with a, with a business, um, there are various agreement related documents that you know, are just vital to establishing the business relationship. You know, these documents, they're legally binding. They set up the, the accountability and responsibility for both sides of the business relationship. And you know, there are some, some well-developed and explicitly documented and addressed business rules that are contained in them. When we seek to establish these new business relationships, you know, there are many types of these documents that need to be processed. It's not a, uh, it's not a single uh, signature, okay? So um, shortly after I, uh, I was brought into the new role, um, I was invited to a, a kickoff meeting with uh, business and technology uh, stakeholders. Um, the business did a great job of describing some existing business processes that we have and how they're looking to improve and accelerate them. Um, you know, specifically, uh, how can we grow our base of merchants and how can we get them you know, up and running quicker? Right? As part of that, there was a, a request to uh, drive improvements in how we produce uh, PDF documents and how we process them for these growing business channels of merchants. Our existing solution at the time was a, a single PDF that was generated. Um, there wasn't very much in the way of customization uh, from a test approach. We could really get away with manual checks for a small number of content details. You know, we could see in the commit logs when something was changing. So it was a, you know, it was it was a, it was not a deep test effort, but it didn't really need to be. And the changes were were relatively infrequent. But with this uh, with this new business uh, opportunity presented to us, uh, we you know we felt technology needed to respond with something that allowed for um, dynamically generated. Uh, PDFs for this onboarding of new business, where paper didn't necessarily have to be carried around, you know, where somebody didn't have to find a pen that might need to write upside down or on a wet countertop or something, right? Um, but along with that, you know, we needed to be more responsive to the business so that, you know, if our legal team was mandating changes in specific text in an agreement, you know, we would need to have to give it a fast turnaround. You know, in, in some states, there are specific laws in the U.S. and states within the United States that uh, govern card transactions. Um, those types of, of state-specific considerations needed to be, uh, to, needed to be captured properly. Um, and then we need to be able to respond to any changes in business rules or clarifications of terminology or any other domain-specific information that would be vital in these documents to make sure that it was you know, very clear what was being expected on both sides. So, you know, we were already set up to do some business specific context checking, um, you know, just, you know, just field checks, right? Very simple things that, you know, the documents we produced had a certain name on them, for example. And we had automation at the service level for those documents that were being generated. So, you know, how do we work towards better given this challenge from the business so that we can empower them. And you know, how can I have influence over this even if I've 
you know, got this new role in the organization. Well, the need, right, beyond the surface that of what I just described, okay, and until we get merchants onboarded, right, until we have them up and running with all forms and, and documents signed and agreed to, there's no revenue that's realized, right? The merchants cannot run any transactions and then, you know, there's no business to be realized there. You know, we were looking to reduce the friction and touch with that process, right? You know, I, I use the expression, allow computing to occur wherever necessary, right? Back to that example of, you know, let's, let's not carry around paper, right? You know, let's not require, you know, pens and signatures and upside down writing, okay? You know, let, let the humans be outworked for once, okay? Um, but that said, um, given these changes in scope, of of the of the updates that can need to take place to these documents um outfitting a test effort for that would have you know some of the following challenges we'd have to you know get multiple monitors for even more than multiple monitors for the testers uh, we have to make a very big time commitment uh, you know we're looking at multiple documents per merchant and you know some of these documents run into the dozens of pages in length uh, we'd also need some new test case infrastructure, right? We'd have to have some documented test plans for each document. You know, we'd have to have metrics on results per build, you know, being able to tie changes to results. And we'd have to counsel our testers on being patient. I mean, I, I said many times, how, how can we ask, you know, professional software testers to become, in many ways, glorified proofreaders to keep up to, to date with all of these changes happening to these documents? But we all knew that we had to be able to empower the business here. The delay for manual tests and checks just, just wouldn't be accepted, right? We'd have, we'd be looking at a cycle time of days possibly for some of these changes. And the time to market is critical because the opportunity that was presented to us by the business had not just a net new opportunity, but also conversion business where we would be bringing in uh, bigger groups of, uh, of new business. So um, with that, um, I'm going to ask that uh, Chris Kane be made the presenter, and uh, he is going to uh, come in and talk to us. Or I'm sorry, I'm actually going to let Chris talk. Sorry about that. I'm going to let Chris talk, and then uh, then uh, he'll ask to uh, to become the presenter to uh, do our demo. So Chris, you want to talk about uh, the solution? Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Um, so the solution we created, I've got to be honest, um, it was an absolute blast to work on. I know that sounds uh, pretty cliche, but I truly enjoyed solving this problem and creating an automated solution for it. So let's get into how we accomplish that. Um, so for starters, at Card Connect, uh, we have an internal microservice called Dynamic Agreement Service, or DASVC for short. This service, when called, allows a user to download the relevant PDF agreements per the merchant's configuration. As of right now, we have five PDF agreements that could potentially apply to any merchant. It's just dependent on their particular setup. Because we have five agreements and could potentially have more in the future, it inherently required a consistent folder structure that would allow for new documents to be added to the automation in a much quicker fashion. Once the PDFs are downloaded, the Apple Tools image tester.jar is called for each PDF agreement. In the early days of creating the automation and running it, we were able to establish our baseline. However, as things change in software development, we received new requirements for some of the agreements and as a result had to eventually establish a new baseline for those agreements. This automation specifically runs overnight because of the amount of PDFs generated and the amount of pages in some of those agreements generated. We utilize the Apple Tools Eyes Batch Run page to check for any potential diffs Typically, this remains uneventful unless there was a recent change to one of the agreements in which those changes would be highlighted in the diff. So now that we've gotten a chance to talk a little bit about the solution, I would just like to speak a little bit more to the path of that solution before getting into the demo. So one of the first steps in creating the solution, honestly, was finding the perfect tool that would allow us to create automation for checking these PDF agreements, mainly because I value my eyesight and I don't hate my eye doctor. Once we identified Apple Tools image tester.jar as the main piece in the solution, 
that would allow us to accomplish our goal, it was off to the races. You know, one of the very first challenges I experienced from the start was realizing that Newman, the Postman command line interface equivalent, did not natively support the downloading of responses generated from the requests sent in the Postman collection. As I'm sure many of you have also experienced in your time as a professional, I realized I was going to have to consult the wonderful Oracle known as Google. I was curious to see if anyone else had experienced the issue I was running into, and if they had, how they went about solving it. Well, lo and behold, I was not alone in my peril and happened across a project hosted on Postman called Write Files to Response. This included both a base Node.js server that was designed to write the response of the request to a file and a Postman collection with two dummy requests with code in the test tab that would post the data from the response to an endpoint that would be coming from the Node.js server. Obviously, as you can imagine, this base project needed quite a bit of customization in order to get it working within the requirements I had written for myself. To this day, it is hands down one of the things I've enjoyed working on the most at my time at CardConnect. The project itself presented a lot of unique challenges, which were a lot of fun to figure out. Probably the most memorable was figuring out the type of data that the Postman collection was posting to the Node.js server. It basically was all symbols and unreadable, and after some re research, I realized writing the response data coming from my Postman collection to a file was not going to be enough. The raw PDF data needed to be rewritten with Base64 encoding in order to actually generate a readable and usable PDF. Beyond that, the other challenges I faced were specific to how we wanted to have the automation run daily. You know, we didn't want to have to worry about any file cleanup, and obviously we needed it to run daily with no human intervention. Um, this led us to storing the PDFs in the folder structure of the particular build number of the Jenkins project. Uh, this also drove where the files were stored and how we use the Apple tools image tester.jar commands, since the path changes whenever the job is run. Um, because the build number increases by one each subsequent run. So now that we've gotten a chance to describe the path that we took to the solution, I think it's time I actually show the solution itself. Addy, if you could make me the presenter so I can go ahead and show the demo. Okay. Let's just see here. All righty. So for this demo, I took my automation that is running uh, daily currently and adjusted it to only three agreements that you guys can see here. I did this to shorten the time the automation runs. Um, with 45 documents, 15 of which 45 plus pages long, I wanted to make sure I'd still be speaking on a Thursday. Uh, I will show you one of the requests since they all inherently do the same thing. Uh, basically, this is a very simple request to our internal microservice DA SVC. Uh, which generates the PDFs. Uh, as you can see, this request requires no body, uh, but the part that we're interested in the most is within the test tab in Postman, uh, which is what I'm showing you guys right now. Uh, this is where the request is made uh, and sent to our local Node.js server that would be running when this runs. In the original project, the author included in the test tab for the entire collection, which would be here. Um, but I opted to include it at the request level just in case I needed to change something specific for a single request. Um, this project creates a JavaScript object, data to file, where I load the request name and data and send a request from Postman to my OJS server to the slash write endpoint along with the data of the response. Now I will open up my Node.js script to show you what happens when it receives a request. So one of the first things I'm sure you guys can see, I have a lot of things commented out. Um, the reason for that is twofold. Uh, one, I shortened my full automation for the purposes of this demo. And I'm also the type of individual where when a piece of code works and does what is expected and isn't used in a production environment, I'm usually content to keep it as is instead of removing everything I don't need. Um, I'm also not an expert when it comes to Node.js and went through a lot of iterations uh, to get this to do exactly what I wanted it. So I will try and explain it as best I can. So one of the first things you'll notice is that I'm taking in an argument, uh, which is the Jenkins build number, uh, which is what drives creating 
the folder structure, as I've previously mentioned, um, for the PDFs within the current uh, build of the project and Jenkins. Now, next I create some relative folder paths um, so that this automation can work on any Jenkins installation. Uh, this was important for me to do because I wanted someone to be able to use this locally on my team if they needed to, um, and to also be able to use it on our enterprise Jenkins box. Um, everything else commented out here are just additional folder paths not being used in this shorter version of the automation. Um, a little further down, uh, shell.mkdir, uh, this is responsible for making the directory. Uh, and I believe the dash p command respects previously created directories on the folder path and won't recreate them if they already exist, which basically means it creates any folders on the path that don't already exist. Uh, this specific piece, the making of the folder paths, was a challenging piece of this for me. Uh, and once it was finally doing what I needed it to, I didn't try to return and to make it more efficient, honestly, because I was afraid I would not be able to get to work like I wanted it to again. Um, so I just left it the way it is now uh, once it was doing what I needed. So once those folder paths are created, um, at this point, the Node.js server is just waiting for a request to get sent to it. Uh, the way this works is that I have a series of if statements. Just give me one second, I just lost my place. Um, so the way that this works is I have a series of if statements uh, based on the request name and the current and the correct folder that they should be placed into. In that same slash write endpoint um, that I have a little further down, after all of these in statement, if statements, I then take the response data object and split it on base64. Once we remove that, we have the data exactly as we need it. Uh, at that point, the file uh, gets encoded with base64 in order to create a readable PDF. That process is then repeated for every single request in the Postman collection. Additionally, uh, I included a set timeout function in app.listen so that the server itself would automatically close and wrap up after two minutes. Uh, originally, I tried doing it from Jenkins, uh, but then I realized that would stop the entire job from being run and wouldn't then execute the calls to the Apple Tools image tester.jar. So at this point, I'm going to kick off the demo, um, which should only take about two minutes to run. Okay, so let me start the Node.js server and let me start the uh, download PDFs job. So one of the first things that we're gonna look at here is we are going to look at the configuration for the download PDFs job as this runs. So as we load up the configuration, uh, I just want to show you guys, it's pretty simple. Uh, it's basically uh, a Newman run command calling your collection uh, and optionally an environment for that collection if you need it. Um, and the second one I want to show you is the Node.js configuration. This is just a little different, but still pretty simple since most of the work is being done in the script and the, you know, uh, Apple Tools image tester.jar itself. Uh, this is a simple call to the, uh, a node call to the shorter script. Uh, and as you can see, I'm also taking in the, the build number, as I mentioned previously. Um, this also includes uh, three calls to the Apple Tools image tester.jar uh, for the PDFs included in this automation. And another thing about this build number um, specifically is that it's uh, exposed as a variable within Jenkins. So you can use that pretty much in any, uh, any automation that you were to put within Jenkins. Um, so now that both of those are started, uh, I wanna bring up the local folder structure of my instance of Jenkins so that you can see the folders uh, and everything that was created as the automation ran. All right, so as I bring that up, um, this is the base folder structure right here. Uh, here we are specifically concerned with the stuff in the jobs folder, so let's click into that. Uh, here you can see the jobs that I have, which is just the two that you saw in the UI. The Node.js job is the one that actually downloads the PDF, so we will need to check in there. Uh, just double clicking into that, um, you'll see we have a folder called builds. Uh, each build has its own folder structure, uh, which you will see shortly. Uh, clicking into builds, uh, we are now looking at all of the builds for this job. 
uh, but we were only concerned with the latest run in this job. So let's access the most recent one, which is going to be 83. Cool. So now you can see responses as a folder uh, inside the current build rev. Now let's click into that. Uh, you'll see that I have a folder for each kind of agreement that was shown in the Postman collection. Uh, let's choose the first one. Uh, typically, I would have included more folders here, uh, but since I trimmed this automation, only complete is included. Uh, clicking in again, we get to moderate, uh, and once more, we get to the actual PDF itself. Now let's open this PDF in Chrome, and I'll show you what it looks like. Alrighty, so this PDF, as you can see, uh, is just an agreement with some values. Um, the, the thing about this is this agreement um, specifically just allows a specific merchant to use a particular service that we offer. But now let's take this sa same agreement and look at it within Apple Tools eyes. Um, in order to do that, we're just going to have to just do a quick refresh to get the latest uh, runs. Uh, specifically, we were looking at the blue checks agreement, so we're going to go ahead and click on that one. You'll see that the latest one uh, is uh, currently with the status of unresolved. Uh, the reason that is, uh, I specifically set up a baseline for this demo uh, and then changed the values in the PDF so that each subsequent run, um, the uh, first page of this PDF agreement would come up as uh, unresolved. So as I load this, you can see here um, that it highlighted the values that changed, um, which were the ones I specifically changed to highlight it on the diff. Um, and honestly, that's pretty much it for this demo. Uh, Dave's gonna come back on uh, about where we go from here. If there are any questions, I would love to try and answer them to the best of my ability uh, later on in this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, but for the time being, I'm gonna throw it back over to Dave who will close us out. Okay, thanks very much, Chris. Uh, that was uh, very cool and uh, <laughs> a real time saver and uh, you know, fit to our, to our vision of what we were trying to do for this project. It's just uh, some additional thoughts. Um, where do we go from here? Um, you know, this is a solution that has been a big win for us, uh, but in many ways, it's only the beginning. Uh, the scope of our PDF validation will grow. Uh, we believe that we'll see more different types of documents. Uh, as the, the business relationships scale, uh, we will see different test data conditions that we have to account for. Um, we'll also see more variance in the business relationships, and then that drives different sets of business rules based on those business relationships. Uh, that will drive either different documents or new documents, um, you know, any other legal considerations that end up, um, you know, in play, okay? Um, we will refine our checks. I mean, we're going to strive for more precise data validations, and, you know, we'll, we'll look at transitioning customer-specific data checks to an automated solution, um, you know, without a deep dive into our, into our strategy around this application. You know, there, there's some more automation transition that can take place, and we will pursue that. Okay? Um, this is not our only uh, usage of the Apple Tools solution. Uh, we're doing some work with some cross-browser test tool integration for visual validation that um, has uh, some great um, collaboration with the development team uh, with the, or with the developers inside the cross-functional team. And uh, we're also starting up a Cypress integration for some additional um, application tests that we do. I wanted to mention that our, our return on investment calculations have been very easy. So anyone that you know either um, is interested in that type of thing, uh, ROI, or needs to know more about it, um, you know, we know what our burden cost of labor is, okay? And again, not trying to turn this into an accounting presentation, but it's the total cost of what it takes to, you know, to pay people, right? Not just their salary, but everything else associated with their work environment. So we know that burden cost of labor. And, you know, we, we had some pretty well calculated planning assumptions for how long and how much it would have taken to manually check the PDF changes. 
but not, not even to take into account the tester impact of, of having manual checks be put in place. And you know, the, for the PDF validation, that's only one application of our ROI calculations. The other uses that we're pursuing will have additional ROI upside. So how are we better in testing? Well, our testers are better, okay? They've been exposed to a cutting edge visual validation automated testing solution. And um, yeah, that's a great thing for them to, to have experience with. Um, we're committing less labor to achieve the same result and it can scale. We're, we're at the beginning of the scalability uh, curve. Uh, and we have an integrated test automation solution that, that ties together you know, more than one uh, automated testing solution that brings us a, a, a holistic um, set of results. So just uh, you know, a reminder uh, to anybody uh, in test leadership or any, anybody that's on a path towards leading a test organization. When it comes to ROI, you know, know your burden cost of labor, right? Ask your manager, your VP, the accounting people, okay? Find out what it is, okay? It should not be a big secret. And then know and quantify how much that burden cost of labor can be, can be saved through pursuing test automation projects. And I, I want to put in there that, that Apple Tools has done a nice job with the integration um, overhead being kept to a minimum. So you're not really burning a lot of dollars on getting things up and running. Um, you know, and then that way you're achieving the ROI more quickly. Um, our testing is better. It will continue to get better. There's an increased coverage, faster test cycles. You know, only in outlier circumstances are, are we resulting or relying on manual um, you know, proofreading or checks. And the time to market for the document changes is meeting the business expectations. But you know, opportunities remain. Okay, so what I want to leave people with today is, is that you know, lead, take upon the opportunities to lead, even if you're not managing. Uh, provide a vision where possible. Okay, the technology continues to evolve. Uh, I mentioned at the outset that uh, this is 30 years for me in software testing as of this year. Um, the, the common technology in place 30 years ago versus now is probably uh, the mouse and the keyboard, right? Everything else has changed. So, you know, maintain uh, an awareness of where technology is going, uh, especially when it comes to automation and ways that uh, leaders can contribute to the test strategy. Never forget the business, okay? Empower the business. Um, anyone familiar with uh, Alan Page's uh, thoughts on modern testing uh, knows uh, how much the importance of the business awareness and business uh, knowledge is emphasized. The digitalization of the workplace continues. So the, the story that we just described about paper documents needing to become something dynamically generated by a microservice and then picked up by a visual validation solution like Apple Tools, we don't have an exclusive on that business need. Uh, any business out there that is generating paper to get signatures um, that need something more dynamically generated, um, you know, this, this has fit there, okay? It can be pursued a similar solution. It's not just us that, uh, that had this challenge. Okay? But ultimately, you know, serve the organization, um, you know, regardless of what your role is, figure out ways to lead and figure out ways to, de to deliver value to the stakeholders, both business and technical. All right, as far as uh, just, we had some thank yous we wanted to put out there. Um, Angie Jones, um, who is just a, a, a great voice for the software testing community. Uh, she did a blog post last year that pretty much set the table for us starting off with, uh, with PDF visual validation uh, from Apple Tools. So that's a great link to uh, review. Uh, I wanna thank the Apple Tools customer success team. Uh, they've been very committed to um, you know, making sure that we're effectively making use of this solution. And um, you know, we, we appreciate their responsiveness and assistance uh, working with us. I um, want to thank the Ministry of Testing community, where I first heard about Apple Tools. Um, if you are not familiar with the Ministry of Testing, their uh, web URL is there. A great community to learn more about uh, testing. I uh, also want to thank uh, Anne-Marie Charrett and her uh, podcast, The uh, Quality Coaching Roadshow, uh, learning a lot more about being able to provide leadership 
envision uh, even if you're not in a management role. I want to thank Card Connect and Fiserv, uh, as well as First Data, which was our, our interim employer along the way for the, for the opportunity to pursue this solution. And I want to thank uh, people that were involved in my early days in testing. Um, you know, they influenced me to pursue a career in testing. And again, I'm very thankful for that. And uh, anybody else out there that has similar people in their careers, um, I hope you think of them from time to time and let them know that, that uh, you appreciated uh, their interest in you. Uh, again, uh, there's uh, my contact info. Uh, Chris is not uh, with a social media presence, uh, but if, uh, you know, if you reach out to me with uh, questions, I'll do my best to, uh, to get them to him. And uh, with that, I'll uh, send it back to Adi. Thanks. Uh, so first of all, thank you for this uh, uh, such an in-depth uh, presentation and demo. And congrats, Dave, on your 20, 20 years in testing. Wow, that's a, that's a, that's a huge milestone. Uh, so um, uh, before we go into the Q&A, I just wanted to mention two things. So first of all, uh, I, got, I got a lot of questions about the recording. So, um, so yes, the session is being recorded and it will be emailed to you by end of day Monday. Uh, and the second question that I got is about the links that are showing here in the presentation. So first of all, uh, you will have them with the slide deck and I will attach them. Uh, I will attach them to the email uh, that I will send to you. So don't worry, you'll get them. Of course, you can, um, uh, you can uh, do a screen grab right now and, and uh, if you don't trust me. Uh, so on to the question. So the first one uh, was received while Chris was doing his demo. Uh, and it goes, do you need a separate Node.js server to parse the response and build the PDFs out of it? Doesn't the backend API return content with proper MIME type, which you can simply dump to any file name with a PDF extension? So, yeah, so that was one of the challenges I ended up running into. Um, specifically, that's, I think that's what I was doing originally, is I was, I had made the assumption that the response data um, that I was posting from my Postman collection to Node.js, that would then basically write a file with a .pdf extension. I thought that would be enough. But every time I went to open that PDF in, you know, Adobe or Chrome or whatever your preferred PDF viewer is, uh, it would come up as corrupt and unreadable. So basically through some trial and error, I realized that, you know, it actually needed to be encoded. And the reason I needed to go through this, um, like I described when I was speaking earlier, was um, Newman specifically uh, does not provide uh, any way to download the response. However, if you were to run my same collection in Postman uh, individually, like each request individually, you are actually able to download a, the PDF that way. However, obviously that's manual um, and we wanted to find a way to do that automated. And one of the things with that challenge was realizing that you needed to uh, do a little more to the data uh, than just write it to a file with a PDF extension. It did need to be uh, basically just encoded again with Base64. I mean, honestly, I went through a lot of research to find that, but I really think in the end, it ended up being a very simple solution. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, next question. Um, are you already using or planning to use uh, the layout algorithm for handling dynamic areas of each PDF for things like names and dates? So uh, I will be honest, um, the, what we showed today in our demo uh, is just the very first step in our uh, eventual established um, automation. It still runs currently daily. Um, but there are additional steps that we want to take with it to improve it. Um, what you mentioned specifically, I am not uh, as aware of all of the uh, features in uh, Apple Tools and the technology that they provide. I specifically uh, have been using the image tester jar that they provide. Um, uh, so I'm not sure if that functionality is exposed there. 
Uh, but if it is, uh, it would certainly be something that we would want to look into, um, especially because um, it's a good thing that you bring that up because there are a lot of PDFs that we do have. Um, and specifically, we have one called the program guide where uh, while that is like 45 plus pages long, a lot of that uh, legal text tends to be static unless there needs to be a change. Um, so that would be uh, really good to use that specifically there to highlight those areas um, so that you could, uh, if you wanted to have checks for different sections of the PDF that you could effectively probably even speed up the time that that entire PDF runs since you're now skipping entire sections of it. Um, so yeah, no, that's definitely something we want to look into. Um, but it's still, uh, still in the infancy stages. Um, another question, is there a limitation on the number of PDF files allowed for processing uh, through Apply Tools? As far as I'm aware, I don't think there's any limitation. Um, I, think you're only, I think the only limitation you might run into is just, you know, um, how long you end up having your collection in Node.js server uh, run for. Um, you know, if you don't really care about time, then you know you're probably fine to run as many as you want. But if you're looking to be efficient, you know it might be it might make more sense to uh, maybe take the same automation and split it into four separate groups. So now that you're taking uh, instead of that one group of PDFs and doing it in one job, now you have four jobs doing four individual groups of that uh, PD, uh, larger PDF group. Um, but as far as I'm aware. Um, Really, I was running, uh, you know, quite a bit through here. The only thing I ever noticed was that, as obviously the longer the PDFs got in length, um, the longer Apple Tools took to process. But they obviously always processed. Um, yeah. So no, I haven't really run into anything, and I feel like you'd really have to. Uh, I feel like you'd really have to push it with the amount of PDFs, and I feel like unless you uh, you're in the business of um, you know, uh, maybe leases or uh, mortgages would, you might not end up with PDFs agreements that large or, or that long where that would become a problem for you. Um, I think we have a question uh, that is about what Dave said in the beginning regarding uh, working with developers. Um, uh, so does your test automation uh, start uh, with uh, with the development or the implementation of the solution, or does it uh, come after or before? Uh, how do you work with your developers uh, when it comes to uh, uh, to creating the test automation that supports the product? Yeah, um, it, it's it's a it's a varying scale. Um, and by the way, I, I'm experiencing a, a storm here. In case there's some background noise, I apologize. Um, you know, we have we have um, cross-functional teams where the testers are um, developing the automation along with the code base, so that when we go live, we have a set of automated regression tests that are ready to go and be you know maintained and extended. Uh, we have you know some projects that that there is some catch up and there is some lag for automation to match the features. Um, but I mean, you know, we're, we've, we've greatly improved it from when the time I started, I was trying to support five or six different projects where I had you know, islands of automation. And where we've improved is we've you know, brought it into a central location for the execution of overnight uh, uh, jobs. We've begun integration into uh, pipelines. So, you know, sliding scale, it depend, you know, that has some context around the specific project, but um, I think we're in, uh, achieving uh, better and better engagement with development as far as uh, working hand in hand with them on the automation development. Uh, we have another question, I think for Chris. Uh, how often do you run these tests and how much time do, uh, do those tests run? How long does it take them to run? Sorry. No, that's fine. Um, so these do run every night. Um, we have two, we actually have two separate, uh, 
I would say, classifications of automation ar around this specifically. Um, so as I mentioned uh, earlier, it run uh, the microservice itself is the dynamic agreement service. And we originally created automation to test the service itself. You know, do the endpoints in the service do what they say they're supposed to do? Um, but as we realized, um, and as we were in discussions with product and development, you know, we were going to need to do a little bit more and to create some sort of automated PDF solution. So not only do we have automation that runs for the uh, service itself, we have automation that runs for the PDFs. So the service itself, which I did not show today, I just want to make that clear, is uh, run, takes two minutes and nine seconds to run. Uh, the full uh, automation for uh, the full collection with all of the PDFs takes the postman collection takes eight minutes and 48 seconds. However, the Node.js portion of that, which is which will run as long as the jar commands take to, you know, uh, basically get a hey, you know, we don't need to send any more data to Apple tools anymore. Um, that took an hour and 14 minutes. So, so, you know, and 15 of those documents are 45 plus pages long. So honestly, I feel like hour and 14 minutes is pretty great. Uh, I feel like there's not Chris, very- excuse me, excuse me, Chris, could I just jump in um, with just a little sure. bit additional context there? Absolutely. Um, I, I, think, I think it's worth stating that, you know, we're in the middle of a, of a sizing and um, expansion project on our Jenkins server. So, you know, the numbers that Chris is giving you right now are, are a point in time, okay? Oh, uh, that's we're true looking, too, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're looking at expanding our concurrent uh, 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 thread execution or job execution. You know, we're looking at expanding uh, CPUs uh, and cores and the VMs. Um, we, you know, we, our entire portfolio now is, is taking most of the overnight to run, but, you know, the next step there is to say, okay, let's look at our profile for our Jenkins box and see where we can grow it, right? We've got some heavy CPU CPU utilization during the overnight jobs. So, you know, the answer that Chris is giving, I, I appreciate the answer, okay? I accept the answer, but it's, you know, we're in the middle of a, of a series of steps to attempt to improve some of the uh, the test uh, execution during, during these overnight runs. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Anything else to add, or can I jump to the next question? I think you can go to the next one. Okay, great. Um, so I think the next one uh, is interesting because I think Chris and Dave, I think that I might ask for both your POVs here. Uh, Dave, maybe your uh, managerial, how to introduce a new tech into the organization, and Chris, how do you actually start using one? Uh, um, uh, so the, the question is, how would a new user start PDF automation through Apply Tools from scratch? What is your uh, suggestion and advice? Um, well, I, I, I was the person that started off in this area so, with us, so, so I, I would direct them to Angie's blog post because Angie's blog post does a very nice job of guiding a user through, um, you know, taking the jar and and you know uh, processing the documents and then checking your results so i mean there's some reasonably well understood good practices right you want to establish your document baselines you want to simulate changes so that you can prove the apple tool solution is checking the changes that you want um, you know early on i did a proof of concept where you know we had an agreement document where i put in a business logo of a bicycle and that was my baseline and then I changed the business logo to like somebody's chat icon, right? And the idea was to demonstrate that, you know, here, here are some of the changes. And then I made some, I made some more subtle changes in the documents. Like I inserted a knot somewhere or I removed a knot, right? Which from a legal or a business rule perspective could have a considerable business impact if that type of business rule change or legal term change um, was placed in, in a document incorrectly and then made it through to a production, you know, business facing and customer facing situation. So um, start small, you know, you know, establish the tool as doing what it is that you want it to do. And then 
um, and then pursue your business context to see how it would, you know, could potentially scale up or be introduced into a real project and then take the project and, um, you know, attempt the POC and then, and then continue to build and scale from there. And yeah, and then, uh, sorry, 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 Chris, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. And then from, from my point of view, I was just going to say, basically, you know, I was more or less given, you know, the image tester jar. Uh, and, you know, at the point, at that point, I had a pretty good idea in my head, you know, um, I knew Postman could download PDF agreements, um, and figured, you know, Newman could as well. Well, very quickly, as I mentioned, I realized that was not the case. Um, so that led me on a search and basically, uh, in addition to, uh, what Dave mentioned with, uh, the Angie Jones, uh, and her information, um, you know, there was a base project and hosted by Postman called Write Files to Response, uh, because I guess obviously someone else ran into the same issue that I did and realized that, you know, someone else might want this at some point. So uh, I started from there um, and basically, you know, once I realized what I needed to do within that, I was able to, to, uh, to start basically. Um, so really, I think it's just understanding, you know, how to how to call the the, the image tester jar, and uh, understanding what your goal and your automation is, and what you want to download, and where you want to get it stored, and and all of that. I think I think you really should uh, get an idea of like the requirements or the kind of structure that you want before heading into it. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that was basically uh, it. So I'm I'm going to uh, I'm going to ask Dave to actually elaborate on on something that is related to that question, uh, and and ask him if you have how was it how did you sell it inside the organization, uh, and that relates to to how do you actually uh, convince the higher ups to uh, to acquire new test new tools new technologies. And implement was it a straight uh, with a straight uh, straightforward type process or uh, or did you have to you know handle objections and show and and show uh, value how did that go um, it, it it went well but but you also needed to be prepared so uh, you know to people out there in leadership roles or, or looking to pursue a leadership role in their careers try to have as many answers ready or try to have as many you know questions that you think that will get asked have the answers ready um, it cuts down on the amount of turnaround time where you would have to go chase down answers um, having having an roi calculation ready to go with with conservative planning assumptions around uh, around dollars saved made this easier i, I think i would have been pressed for roi um, if I didn't have it uh, in the initial proposal. And then, you know, after that, it becomes uh, a big company purchase approval, which, you know, depending on the audience, you know, some of you may be intimately familiar with that, some of you may not be, right? But yeah, I mean, we, we gave it a, a, a technical application to the project that we mentioned in the presentation. And then, um, you know, there was also a history where we had been um, established with a reputation of, this is an organization that has pursued free or low cost tools. So if they're coming after a capital purchase, this must mean that you know they they really need it. So that 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 helped us as well. Great. So unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. Uh, so um, uh, of course, if you have any follow up questions about what you saw here today, uh, Dave's. Uh, uh, social media uh, links are at the bottom of this uh, of the slide that's still up here uh, so you can reach out to him uh, over there and uh, uh, obviously uh, I'm sure that uh, you can continue the conversation so before I let Dave and Chris say their goodbyes I want to thank everyone that joined us for this live session and of course thank Dave and Chris for this in-depth hands-on session the recording with the slides will be sent to you by end of day Monday, as promised, and I do hope to see you at our next event. Yeah, uh, just want to thank everybody again for joining. I uh, hope that uh, you found it uh, informative and useful. And uh, any questions, uh, I'll do my best to engage and uh, 
work with you on getting answers. Yep, thank you guys for attending. I appreciate it. Um, if there are any questions, uh, you can funnel those through Dave, um, and I will do my best to answer them. Thanks again for coming.